Nice weather we're having. Yes. Well, I, um... You may sit down if you like. Oh, are you sure? I, I don't want to interrupt your own reading. No, really sit. I would like very much for you to do so. The light is too bad for you. I would prefer to talk. Well, if you insist. You've got to be the most stunningest girl I've ever seen. Honest. I've had my eye on you since yesterday. Yesterday? <laughs> Didn't know somebody was bowled over by those pretty lampseals, did you, honeysuckle? Whoever you are, you must remember that I am late. I will excuse the remark you've just made, because the mistake was doubtless not an unnatural one in your service. I asked you to sit down. If the invitation must constitute me your honeysuckle, consider it withdrawn. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Just, well, there are girls in the parts. That is, you don't know, but, um, yeah, sorry again. Abandon the subject, if you please. Of course I will. Right. Now, tell me about these people passing and crowding each way along these paths. Where are they going? Why do they hurry so? Are they happy? It is interesting to watch them, isn't it? The wonderful drama of life. Some are going to dinner. Some to, well, or other places. One can't help but imagine what their histories are. Yes, how fascinating they seem to me, rushing about with their petty little dreams and common worries. I come here to sit, because here only can I be near the common, throbbing heart of humanity. My part in life is cast where its beating is never felt. Can you surmise why I spoke to you, Mr. Parkinson? And your name? No, you would recognize it immediately. It is simply impossible to keep one's name out of the papers, or even one's portrait. This hat and this veil, my maids, of course, are my only protection. They furnish me with an incog. Candidly, there are five or six names that belong in the Holy of Holies, and mine, by the accident of birth, is one of them. <laughs> I spoke to you, Mr. Stacker. Parkinsacker. Parkinsacker. Because I wanted to speak for once with a natural man, a real man, one unspoiled by the despicable gloss of wealth and supposed social superiority. Oh, you have no idea how weary I am of it. Money, money, money. And of the men who surround me dancing like little marionettes all cut from the same pattern. I am sick of pleasure, of jewels, of travel, of society, of luxuries of all kinds. I always uh, had the idea money must be a pretty good thing. A competence is to be desired, certainly. But when you have so many millions, it is the monotony of it that falls. Dinners and drives and theaters and balls and suppers and more balls and dinners and theaters with the gilding of superfluous wealth over it all. Sometimes the very tinkle of the ice in my champagne glass nearly drives me mad. <laughs> you know, I've, uh, I've always liked to read up on the customs and habits of the wealthy class. I, I consider myself a bit of a connoisseur on the subject. But I like to have my information accurate. Now, I have formed the opinion that champagne is uh, cooled in the bottle and not by placing ice in the glass. <laughs> you must understand that we of the non-useful class depend for our amusement on departure from precedent. Just now, it is a fad to put ice in champagne. It will soon give way to some other room. Just as at a dinner party on Madison <sighs> Avenue, a green kid glove was placed by the plate of each guest to be put on and used while eating olives. Oh, I see. These special diversions of the inner circle do not become familiar to the common public, of course. Of course, of course. It's all quite fascinating. I, for one, have always wanted to experience, or at least witness firsthand, the, uh, the rituals of the elite. We are all drawn to that which we do not understand. I guess that's true. For my part, I've always thought that if I should ever love a man, it would be one of lowly station. One who's a worker and not a drone. But alas, claims of caste and wealth will prove stronger than my inclination. Just now I am besieged by two suitors. One is Grand Duke of a German principality. I think he has or has had a wife somewhere, driven mad by his intemperance and cruelty. The other is an English Marquis who is so cold and mercenary I prefer almost the diabolical nature of the Duke. 
What is it that impels you to tell you these things, Mr. Packenlager? <coughs> Parkinson. <laughs> I don't know why you uh, should bear your soul to a common man like me, but you can't know how much I appreciate your confidences. What is your line of business, if you don't mind my asking? A very humble one, but I hope to rise in the world someday. You have aspirations? Oh yes, there's so much I want to do. I admire your enthusiasm. I myself can find very little to be enthused about, burdened as I am by the constant pleasures and diversions of my class. Did you, uh, did you really mean it before when you, um, you said, you know, you could love a man of a, oh man, lowly station? <laughs> Indeed I did. But I said might. Of course, uh, why only might? Well, there's the Grand Duke and the Marquis to think of, you know. Well, you've said it yourself, they're so... Cold. I'm sure you understand when I say that there are certain expectations of a young lady in my class. It would be such a disappointment to certain members of my family if I were to marry a commoner, as we like to call them. No, you simply cannot imagine the scandal it would cause. All the magazines would remark upon it. I might even be cut off from the family fortune. And yet, no calling could be too humble where the man I love all I wish him to be. I work in a restaurant. Not as a waiter. Labor is noble, but personal attendance, you know, valet. Oh, no, no, not as a waiter. I'm a, I'm a cashier in the uh... Oh, that restaurant over there. <coughs> that, that restaurant. Are you sure? Oh, quite sure. Uh, I, I'm late for an engagement. An engagement? Yes, yes. Oh, some sort of dinner or ball? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I see you again. Perhaps, but the whip may not seize me again. I must go quickly now. There's a dinner and a box at the play, and oh, the same old round. Perhaps you noticed an automobile in the upper corner of the park as you came. The one with the white body? And red running gear. Yes, I always come with that. Pierre waits for me there. He supposes me to be shopping in the department store across the square. Conceive of the bondage of life when we must deceive even our chauffeurs. Again, good night. Wait, you know, it's getting dark and uh, the park is full of questionable characters. Can I walk you to- No! I mean, no. If you have any regard for my wishes, you will remain on this bench for ten minutes after I've left. <laughs> I do not mean to question your intentions. But you are probably aware that autos genuinely bear the monogram of their own. Again, good night. Mary Jane! Mary Jane Parker! What on earth are you doing out here? Don't you know what time it is? Madame, to whom are you speaking? To whom am I? To you? Who do you think, you ninny? <laughs> then I'm quite sure I don't know what you're talking about. Your shift started 15 minutes ago. Mr. Witherspoon's in a rage. This is the third time this month you've been late. You better get yourself over there and into uniform before he cuts you loose for good. <laughs> Madame, you must have me confused with someone else. Confused with? Oh, I'm Mary Jane Parker. We've known each other for three years. We swap shifts. Have you been drinking? Why are you wearing that ridiculous hat? I am sorry, Mr. Parkenbacher. Park and Stacker. <gasps> Park and Stacker. Park and Stacker? As in the Park and Stackers from the Society Pages? <laughs> Shall I cancel or? No, no, I, I'm coming. 
Very good, sir. The auto is waiting. <laughs> <laughs>